Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Please join us and sing. Stand up if you're able. Amen.
visiting and worshiping with us. We're so glad to have you. Pastor Park is here. Nice. <laughs> and his wonderful wife, Linda. It's good to have you with us today. And I'm sure we'll hear something else from you later on. Is that all right? We'll give you a chance to <laughs> work that out. But it's good to see both of you. It's good to see all of you smiling faces. I can't see those online, although we would love to see you. And that invitation stays out there for you to join us as we worship and praise our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, praise team, for that wonderful song, Uplifting, as we come into service. And I will offer a word of prayer at this time before the pastor comes. Let us bow our heads. Father God, we bow our heads and we thank you so much we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for the water, Lord. We thank you for washing things off. And we ask, Father, that you just continue to bless us. Bless the service today. Bless each one that's on their way. Give them traveling mercies. Bless those that are here in-house, those that are online watching. We ask that they continue to praise the Lord with us. Lift their hands, clap their hands, plat up, stomp their feet. Just enjoy service today as we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' name, we pray these things. Let us all say, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath again, everyone. How does it sound? Use other mic. <laughs> test, test. Ah, oh, there we go. There we go. That's good. That's good. Have a few announcements for you today. Again, my first announcement is, come on, California people. It was just a drizzle today. <laughs> so I expect more views online since I don't see your faces who were here last week. That's all right, though. That's all right. Or maybe they're in traffic. Maybe they're in traffic. We'll go with that one. <laughs> but that's all right. Thank God for the rain. I'm going to switch. I'm going to switch. Thank God for the rain. I know we need it. I know it is weird uh, to be here in Southern California in August and September and dealing with rain, but I will take it any way we can get it. So praise God for that. Uh, yes, we know Labor Day weekend is coming up. I hope it doesn't rain if you have plans. <laughs> uh, we're grateful for that as well. Also just wanna say thank you to everyone who was there to support the Atmore and Washington family yesterday at their funeral service. Uh, it was good to see our All Nations family show up and support. And I just have to take a moment. I didn't get to tell this person this at the service, but uh, Minister Greg, I took note of what you were doing when we were doing the final viewing. And I, it, it was so nice and smooth. I turned around and I was like, okay, go ahead with your bad self. All right there. All right, that, that was really nice. Okay. He, he had a good time yesterday as well. So thank you again to everyone who was there to support the family and the celebration of our loved one, Billy Atmore, uh, and his life. So please remember to keep the family in your prayers and to support them. Probably won't see them for a little bit as well. You know, these things are difficult. But continue to reach out and to pray for them and uh, call during the week to see how they are doing as well. And I said, hey, whatever you need, if we gotta send some food over, we will keep doing that as well. Also, on behalf of me and my wife, I just want to say thank you so much, All Nations, for last week. That was really special. My family, we all enjoyed it. Even the family who were, was able to come from out of state uh, thank you so much for celebrating my daughter Eden's dedication and just a wonderful time. And we really, really are grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I know that service was a little long last week, but it was good. I enjoyed myself. <laughs> I didn't have to preach, so I enjoyed myself. You know, I, I was able to relax for once and just take note. 
So Elder Park, I'm going to keep talking until you're ready to preach. Just let me know. I don't mind taking another break, you know. Go ahead, pinch him a little bit. Get, tell him to preach one of the good ones you like. Help him out. Help me out. I'm just <laughs> we are happy to have both of you here today as well. Thank you for visiting us. Uh, yes, and everyone who was here, the guest pastors who were here last week, they were all so grateful, and they say thank you as well. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Words cannot truly express how grateful we were, we are for what took place last week. I also want to remind everyone that we, next Sabbath, we are doing the Blessing of the Backpacks. Again, that is for students from preschool all the way up to graduate school, whatever you're doing. If you are doing a certification program, we want to pray over you as well. I mean, if you are doing anything education related, we want to pray over you next week. So we're not just doing it for those who are students. We're praying for the parents as well. If you have a student who's already away in school, you are more than welcome to stand in for that student uh, as we pray for them. But we are also making an invite to those who are teachers. So I know a couple have been invited already, but if you know any teachers or anyone, uh, maybe school administration, anyone who works in education, please invite them as well. We are going to have a separate prayer for them also. Yes, I know the school year has started, but no grades have come out yet. We still have caught that window. So we do want to take this moment to pray over everyone who is going through school this school term. Again, that is next week. So please take note of that. I will pray it doesn't rain because now I know how y'all do when it rains. Yeah. I mean, come on, you, you saw the place was last week. Y'all get me excited, and then a little bit of drizzle, and then it's like, mm, we ain't coming out. <laughs> Thank goodness God doesn't say I'm not coming out. I'm, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop. I'm not going to, I'll stop, I'll stop before I get there. <laughs> I know, bad me. Uh, board members, we have a board meeting September 14th, and my favorite announcement on September 30th, we have a baptism. Amen, amen. Just wave. I know you don't like all the attention. Just wave, but I'm excited. Yeah, she's getting baptized. Let's give her a hand. Yes. <laughs> amen, amen. As happy as we are, know that heaven is a million times more excited. So keep that in mind as well. And that would be the 30th. Also on the 30th, we will have potluck and an AY to follow with a Bible bowl based on Joshua. So if you are like me and you like to win, I hope you are studying up on your Joshua starting now as you get ready for the Bible bowl on the 30th. If I start losing, I'm going to say I can't play because I'm the pastor, but you know how I do. That's all right. Pray for me. And also for those who I know we've talked about a children's program and I understand there is a bit of confusion going on uh, this morning. Sorry for that. Uh, I did announce a few weeks ago that we were still waiting to get some things in place before we started the children's program. We will let you know it will be announced. It will go out in the calling posts when we are ready to get that rolling. So I do apologize for the confusion earlier today about that, uh, but we are still working some things out and hopefully that will be up and running at some point this month. So please keep that in mind as well. And if you would like to volunteer to help, you can never have enough volunteers. And that goes to those watching online as well. Uh, the more hands make the workload light. And I believe that is my last announcement, but we do have some business we need to tend to today. Uh, we, need, we actually need an additional name for our nominating committee. Uh, one of the names was not a baptized member, so we are working on that. Uh, so we do need a name to fill out the list of seven. So, so far, we have Angelica Pendergar, we have Jimmy Obias, Jackie Howard, Dwayne Montgomery, Mark Henderson, and Alfonso Jarrett. So I will entertain one additional name from the floor. Uh, remember to keep in mind you're thinking of a name of someone who knows a lot of the church family, knows those who may be watching online and not here, and someone who 
has been around long enough to understand where a lot of people may have their gifts. Brother Al, you have a name. Wait, I should have Tina writing this instead of me, huh? <laughs> Are you writing it down? So that is a nomination for Sister Candy. Amen. Well, I mean, since you're here, Sister Candy, you... Do you know more than 15? <laughs> Better question, are you willing? We can work. There's enough people on the team. No pressure, no pressure, no pressure, no pressure, but... If you are willing, you would be a blessing, a blessed addition to that committee. Would you like to tell me later? No? You'll tell me now? Yeah, all right. She says she will tell me now. She said yes. Thank you so much. So we have seven names. You have heard the seven names. And remember, we, we decided to take the route where we would not go through the, uh, the special committee to select the nominated committee, but we actually went, came from the floor. So you've heard the names, Sister Candy, Angelica, Jimmy, Jackie, Dwayne, Mark, Alfonso. Is there a motion to accept these seven names as our nominating committee so we can get together and pick a date that works for everyone and get the ball rolling? I saw his hand first. You can be the second, but go ahead. <laughs> All right. Thank you. There is a motion. It's been moved. Is there a second? All right. We have a second right there. Are there any questions on that? Any questions? You had a whole week to ask me questions about the other name, so. All right. All in favor with accepting these names as our nominating committee with the sign of I and raising your hand. All right. Any opposed? Same sign. It is moved and carried. Thank you so much for your time. And we will get on with the business of the church. Thank you again, church family. Uh, I hope you are blessed by the rest of service today. that the young men just come right up don't even have to call them that's good I was looking for for Camille but that's okay we we go forward from here do you know the story about Gideon and his army Gideon when you read the seventh chapter in the book read that story about Gideon, but let me tell you a little bit about that, what happened. The Amorites, all these warriors were going to come and fight against the children of God. And Gideon was basically chosen to be the leader, okay? I'm kind of summarizing here for you, all right? So all the people that were in the villages came together and they said, well, we're going to fight. We're going to fight these, these armies, right? And it was a bunch of them. It was a bunch of people. As a matter of fact, at one point, you know, God said, well, Gideon, uh, you got too many people. And, and the Amorites and all the, 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 the warriors that were coming up against them, the, they, were, they were scattered over the land. And so... At a point here, they came together, and God said, ask the ones that are afraid to go home. Now, if I were to say that to the church this morning, we've got a war that's going to go on, and we've got a number of people that are going to battle against the church, and they number against the whole, they, they just number against the whole city. How many of us would be afraid and want to go home? 
Well, <laughs> out of all these people, 22,000 of the people that had come with brooms and rakes and everything that they had to fight, they went home. They weren't going to fight that battle. And then God said, well, Gideon, you still have too many people. Hmm, interesting. So he says, take them to a river, let them drink water out of the river, those that lap like a dog, you want to keep those. And then wound up being 300 people against a vast number of an army. Now, look what God does. A dream, he gets a dream and he talks about this dream and so forth. Something happened when Gideon was, was set up with his army. He had 300 men now against his whole army. Can you imagine? When you look out over the hills, you've got this army that's just spread out all over the hills. And you've got 300 men that are going to fight them. In their minds, they were going to fight them because they trusted God, right? So when it came time to fight, he said, okay, give your man a lantern and a trumpet. And at my sound, I want you to blow the trumpets, clang the pans, and let me do the rest of the work. That's what God did. And guess what? Gideon and his 300 men didn't even have to lift a sword. The army fought against themselves. Yeah, I know. I know. It's amazing, huh? He's sitting there going, what? Yeah, they fought against themselves, basically killing themselves. Because it was in the dark, and they thought they were completely surrounded. And so they were afraid, and they basically killed themselves. God is a, is, is a powerful God. He can do things that we can't even begin to imagine. Right? But if you go there with the heart, depending and trusting, then it's when you can see the miracles of what God can do. Amen? Amen? We don't see miracles today, folks, because I think our trust level is probably running pretty close to empty. And we need to boost that trust up and that faith in God so that we know that we can count on him. He's true to his word. Amen? Have you seen him tr true to his word? He's done things for you. You told me that before, huh? Amen? Amen? Amen. So the story is, if we trust God, amazing things. You know, if you didn't read this story in the Bible, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> right? But it's here. It's word. God is able to do more than we can ever imagine for us and benefit us. Amen? Someone like to lead us in prayer? Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that you have done this week. Please help everybody and all the children to be better people. Please help us trust in you and believe in you, you all the time and every day. Amen. 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 Thank you for that prayer. Thank you so much. All right, God bless. Oh, we have some more back in the back.
stand up and sing if we can. We're going to rejoice in the Lord always. Hallelujah.
favorite time of worship. This is the time when we come in the presence and the very presence of God. This is the time when the Holy Spirit prepares our hearts and our minds for the blessing that he has appointed for us. In Psalm 145, verses 18 and 19 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. Do you believe that? Then please stand, because we come into the presence of the Lord. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we bow, we bow at your feet. We acknowledge, Father, that you are the Holy One, the one that gave your life to save us, to rescue us, to reconcile us with you. And Father, as we come to you this morning, we ask that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wash us with the precious blood of Jesus. Father, draw us closer to you. Draw us closer to the throne of grace. We have come this morning, Father, to worship you. And in this congregation, our brothers and sisters that need your precious holy touch. We ask, Father, that you be with each one of us here today. And our brothers and sisters also, they are worshiping you online. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. But we also ask, Father, that you touch the broken hearts, that you touch the bodies that are aching because of illness, that you just Help us, Father, to take that one more step to come closer to you. We have run out of time, but we know, Father, that you are more powerful than the enemy. We know that you are more powerful than anything or anyone. So, Father, help us. Help us to come closer to you. And, and yes, find us faithful when Jesus comes to take us home. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. struggle is over. And I know we go through life and we get through issues in life and sometimes we don't give credit to God where it belongs. 
But here we are at this time where we can actually give back what God has given us. And he has been so, for lack of a better term, free-hearted, loving, blessing us beyond our imaginations. Amen. So for those online and in-house, I'm going to offer three ways of giving this morning. Those online and also in-house, the IR code is there for your convenience. As you know, by using your smart device, just scan and give what God has laid on your heart to give. Or you can join us in person and place your giving into the offering plate as you worship and praise the Lord with us. We prefer that. Or you could mail your tithe and offering or donation to All Nations Seventh-day Adventist Church at 1948 South Peck Road, Monrovia, California, 91016. We would love to greet you in person with the love and hope in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we invite you to join us and share his amazing love. What is the motivation for giving in church? That motivation is to support reaching the lost with the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Will the deaconess please come forward? you've given to us already. And we ask that you would just bless those that give this morning, rain down upon them the treasures that they have not room to receive. Father, we ask that you would move forward within this time. Bless each one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. halfway, but I just want to say before we do our scripture, I am so blessed, as well as I feel like all of you are, to be in the house of the Lord today. I am really enjoying service. Um, we'll be, I'd like for everyone to stand for the reading of God's word. We're reading from Psalms 107, 1 through 9, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. 
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. The Lord redeemed you, then spoke out. Tell others, that, tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from the east, west, from the north, and the south. Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless. Hungry and thirsty, they nearly died. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to the city where they could live. Let them praise the Lord for his great love, for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he satisfies the thirsty. May the Lord add a special blessing to the reading and hearing of his word this morning. Amen.
can say amen again. It is only because he has decided to pour out that breath of life in our lungs that we are here today. We serve a good God, church, an awesome and mighty God. Thank you so much for that reminder, praise team. Every day above ground is a day to say thank you. And I have had a week this week, and I'm sure you have had a week and all your ups and downs, but it is a blessing to be reminded that the one who gave us breath, the one who allowed us to wake up today, the one we are worshiping today, he went through that tough week with us, and he carried us through whatever we went through. Some of us he had to drag. Some of us he was just standing side by side. But it's a blessing to be reminded that the creator takes time for each and every one of us. I ask that you bow your heads as we get started this afternoon. Father, I say thank you. Thank you for being so good. Thank you for seeing fit for us to be here to worship you today. Lord, as we talk about your goodness, I pray that someone is reminded that you truly are good and you truly want the best for them. And I know it's difficult when we are going through it, Lord, but I pray that our hearts are touched with your goodness. Be with my thoughts and my words. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. I have a brief video for you I'd like you to look at. Some of you may remember that clip. It's from the movie, The Help. Beautiful moment, brought some of us to tears when we saw it. Yeah, I probably teared up a little bit. I'm not even gonna lie. <laughs> but the beautiful idea of affirming a young mind and reminding them that you are beautiful, you are important, you are kind, you're special. There's something to be said about either a daily affirmation or a daily reminder. So today my focus is to remind us, affirm for us that God actually is good. We say it sometimes, but it doesn't quite hit. We get accustomed to walking in our Christian walk and we really have to stop and say, God is good. There's a devil in this world, and he's upset, and that's why we have to deal with bad things. But it hurts God's heart when he sees that we are sad. He cries when we cry when we've lost loved ones. He shows joy when we are excited about how he's overcome for us. And we have to remind ourselves every now and then, affirm our belief that he truly is good. Just quickly, throughout Christian history, we've had many affirmations of faith. One of the most famous ones is the Apostles' Creed, uh, which it talks about the entire Trinity, what they believe that Jesus died and he rose after three days. I'm not going to read the whole thing for you. Uh, it's basic Christianity 101. Look it up. But it's a reminder of who God is in all three persons and what God has done and what God will continue to do for you. An affirmation of faith is a set of beliefs based on scripture that define what we believe and what we teach and what we want people to know who may not be Christians. 
that we believe. How many of you remember growing up in an Adventist church and you had to recite the fourth commandment? Oh, I know that was the thing. That was the thing. And then some of you got a little upset when we stopped doing that. So there was a discussion in seminary where the professors would remind us, the fourth commandment is not a creed. It is the fourth commandment. <laughs> if you want a creed, come up with a creed. <laughs> so, so just so you, you feel a little better, an example of using the idea found in the fourth commandment as a creed would be something on the lines of, I believe that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were all three present at creation and created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day Sabbath. That's your more creedal thing, not the command. <laughs> I just did that to mess with some of you. One thing that when you're looking through these different creeds, you are seeing a theme that God is good and that God sh always shows up and that it is not in God's nature to let his people down. The idea is you're declaring something true about God that someone who is not a believer can hear and say, man, that sounds good. But then also see in your life that you are living said creed. So, so keep that in mind as we go through Psalm 107, reminding us of what God has done for us. I know some of you are saying, why Psalm 107? You know, there's so many other verses you could have picked. Yes, there are so many verses I could have picked. So many verses talk about the goodness of God. But there's something special in Psalm 107 where the constant theme is God delivering us from various situations. Some of these situations God's people put themselves in. Mm, we can speak about the things, the trouble we put ourselves in. Uh, some of these were, you know, their enemies were an issue. Some of these, they pushed God away and said, we have it all under control. But there's a constant theme in this where God will show up and tries to remind his people and, and reminding them that he's always there for them and he hasn't forgotten them in spite of themselves and what they have done to push him away, despite whatever enemy has crept up, despite what is going on, God is a constant in this passage. So let's start verse 1, and it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Why? For he is good. I really could go home on that one. It doesn't just stop there. We are told, for his loving kindness is what? Endures forever, or my Bible says everlasting. So right then and there, we are told to give thanks to God because he actually is good. And his goodness lasts forever. Verse 2 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Which is a very interesting thing. When we deal with that word redeemed, help me out. What are we redeemed from? Sin. Thank you. Death. Thank you. What else? The enemy. Aren't these some things to get excited about? And some things to, to say out loud every now and then? A lot of times, and, and I'm speaking for myself, I'm guilty of this. I will say, oh, I've been redeemed. We know songs. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, filled with the Holy Ghost I am. Been redeemed. You know, we say it, but we don't really sit and wrestle with what we have been redeemed from. Some of us have been redeemed from the demons of alcohol and drugs. Some of us have been redeemed from the, the demons of, of sexual abuse. Some of us have been redeemed from physical, emotional, whatever family baggage we have been redeemed from. You don't have to jump up and say the exact thing, but when you say redeemed, I want you to understand 
not just the overarching redeemed in terms of Christianity, but what has he redeemed you personally from? He's redeemed some of us from being selfish. He's redeemed some of us from being some really horrible people, which is some jerks. He's, he's redeemed some of us from that. Some of us are still in that process. <laughs> But it is okay. He is not going to give up on you. When we recite this passage and we come back to it, we have to stop and pause. Yes, he has redeemed me from sin. Yes, and I thank him for that. Yes, he has redeemed me where I don't have to deal with the consequences of an eternal death. Thank God for that. And those who die in him, we are hoping and we are trusting about that second resurrection. And we have that blessed hope of seeing him throughout all eternity. And yes, he is, you know, he's, he's redeemed us from the, the evil one, the, the deceiver, Satan, who says, your creation is no good. We talked about this with Job. You know, they only serve you because you're taking care of them. Let some bad things happen and see if they still talk about, ooh, God is good. But sometimes we just have to pause when we get to the sin part and really personalize it to ourselves. Like, yeah, he brought me out of a lot of things there. Ooh, he's good. He's so good. And it doesn't just stop there. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hmm. It says, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. We're supposed to be sharing what we've been redeemed from. I know some of you, you're like, oh, good. I want to get up front and tell all my business. No, no, no. It's not about telling your business. It's about when the Holy Spirit touches upon your heart to share with someone what he has brought you from. And you know what I'm talking about. You meet someone, you get to know them, and you're like, oh, man, I really feel impressed to talk to this person. I don't want to be bothered right now, but I feel like God is really putting this person on my heart. And you know what it is? You're driving and the person pops up in your mind. You're sitting at home watching TV and the person pops up in your mind. And you're like, Lord, leave me alone. I don't want to. I don't want to. And when you finally stop fighting with him and you do what he asks you to do and you're like, wow. I just had an amazing experience with that person. I share with them how far God's brought me, and they actually can relate. They're going through some of the same struggles. I should just stop there and say, look, let's go home after that. We are supposed to give thanks because he is good, and his goodness lasts forever. We're supposed to remind ourselves what he has saved us from, and we're supposed to share. Share the experience. Sometimes we like to share like this. Well, brother, I seen you coming around this church every now and then. Don't you know that the seventh day, the seventh, come on over here. That, we like to share with this. And then we see him, we're like, I know you sing well, but you need to pop, 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 pop. And, and then we pop, 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 pop. I know it's a double-edged sword, but it doesn't mean you're supposed to wield it like one all the time. We are supposed to share because I tell people, some people think only pastors can, you know, do the, the speaking. And the, no, no, no. There are some people I will never be able to reach and only you can reach. Amen. That's the beauty of this thing of God allowing us to walk hand in hand in this blessed work with him. There are you have certain interests and certain gifts and, and your little quirks that are God given quirks that you can relate to some people and I won't be able to understand any of that. There's something, someone special for you to connect to, and we just have to be willing to share what he has done for us. The psalmist goes on and says, verse 3, And gathered from the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south, they wandered in the wilderness in a desert region, they did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. So he's recounting the history of God's people. Wandering in the desert, ending up captives in Egypt, uh, almost forgetting who God is in a certain sense and forgetting what he had done in that rich history of him involving himself in their lives and, and living under an oppressor in Egypt 
who had many gods and thinking, well, this must be the way we live our lives. It says in verse 6, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distress. I love verse 6 because verse 6 reminds me, whatever distress, whatever trouble I am in, I can always cry out to him. Some of us, we go through some hard times, and there's something about the devil and how he attacks us. He, he knows us really well, so we start going through a hard time, and he tends to isolate us. You know what I'm talking about. You get in that rut. You don't want to talk to your family. You don't want to talk to your friends. You don't return people's phone calls or text messages, and you kind of like, leave me alone. I'm not in a good spot, and you're isolated, and you're just off to the side, and then he starts telling you those things. Nobody cares about you. God don't like you. God's too busy making sure the world and universe don't collide into each other. He ain't got time for you. Don't bother crying out. Don't bother falling on your knees and asking him. He's got more important things to do. We allow the devil to just slander God's name and have us feeling that we are the lowest of the lows. But I'm reminded here in this psalm, it says, they wandered in the wilderness. They didn't have a home. They were, they were in captivity. They were hungry and they were thirsty. Probably at their lowest point, they cried out to him in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. When you think about that, and we try to apply it to our lives today, I know the first thing is, well, pastor, I've been praying and the Lord just hasn't shown up yet. Well, the Israelites were in slavery for 400 years. Oh, that's a tough one right there. And I do believe, though, within that 400 years, there were still people who held on and believed in God. Because there's always a handful. God always has his people who are still going there in the struggle, there to remind people that, you know what, this isn't going to last all the time. There is some hope here. There, we've got to hold on. So I still believe that we can call out in our times of need, and he will deliver us right on time. Amen. Verse 7 tells us, it goes on, it says, not only did he deliver them, he led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. Did you catch that? Remember what it said in verses 4 and 5? They didn't have anything. They didn't have a city. They didn't have a home. They were wandering. God, they call out. They're like, help me, Lord. Help me. We're being oppressed. We're being taken advantage of. Not only does he come in and he saves them, but then it says he guides them through a straight way, and he takes them to an inhabited city. The short version of it, he still provides for our needs today. Whatever you are lacking, whatever, wherever you are lacking in, in your life and you're crying out to him, he will still show up and provide for you today. We need to be reminded of that. He truly is good. And yes, I know someone's saying, well, you know, they kind of went the long way. And uh, they went the long way because of themselves and the decisions they made. They were pushing him away even after he saved them. But did he leave them? Remember, we're talking about the children of Israel. My Bible tells me even in their complete turn away from God, there is still a pillar of fire and a cloud. There are still the sanctuary processes that were taking place. Even when they were like, we want to do our own thing, get on, and they were wandering around for all those years, a whole generation. He was still there. Just wrap your mind around that. The God we serve is so willing to save us that even when we kick him and tell him to go away, we want to do our own things, he still doesn't leave us hanging. Still doesn't leave us hanging. Still had visual evidence that he was still there for the people. The equivalent of that would be like a flame just shooting up here, and, and that was the symbol of, ooh, God's here today. I bet we'd act a lot different, too. I hope so. I sure would. I'm like, ooh, I'm going to stand over here just in case I'm not right. <laughs> they had visual evidence that God was with them, and they still 
turned away and did their own thing. But yet he still took their children to the promised land when he could have said, I need to go find a new people. And how quickly do we do that? How quickly do we sit there and we throw people to the side? I'm like, that is not even worth dealing with anymore. Family relationships, whatever relationships we have, that person will never do right by me. I don't care. I don't know. Uh, Lord, fix them. Smite them, Lord. But we forget how patient he has been with us. How good he has been. How much hand-holding he has done with us. How quickly we forget. Verse 8 reminds us, it says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul. He has filled with what is good. So this is reiterating what I just said. He, he, he gives them wonders, evidence that he's still working in their lives. The miracles that are happening that they saw, the miracles of how many years wandering and we didn't hear that their clothes fell apart? Forty years, a whole generation. Their sandals, we didn't hear they had to go, to go to the Egyptian Nike store and get some new sandals. We didn't hear about that. It says all these things were provided for. They were wandering. They didn't leave the camp there and just stay. They were pick up the camp and they were moving. Moving around in a circle because of their decisions. Probably was annoying. I've seen that rock five months ago, and now we're back in. There's that rock again. And yeah, make better decisions. Even with all that going on, he's still providing their basic needs. So what is that one for us? Do we take time to thank God for our basic needs that he still takes care of today? Do you have to walk the streets with no shoes on your feet? You may be buying Payless. You may be buying Nike and everything in between. But your feet are covered. There's some people in this neighborhood whose feet are not covered. They're those who are less fortunate. So when he reminds them to give thanks for his loving kindness, for he has done miracles and he has taken care of, you need to stop and say, it is a miracle. With the little bit of money that I make, I'm able to feed my family, pay my bills, and actually have something extra to have a little fun. That is a miracle. We take some things for granted. Are you listening to the news? They're still blaring, ah, recession, inflation, ah, where's the money coming from? The economy's going to blow up, ah, what's going on? They've been saying it for eight, nine months. I'm not wishing for it to happen. You know my take on this. I believe God is holding some things back because he's still trying to help folks along. But his believers, this is where we need to stand up and say, I thank you, God, for doing your math and making my bank account make sense. Because I know how much I get paid, I know how much the government takes out of it, and I know how much my bills are. And sometimes it should not add up. <laughs> but then you keep trusting God and his goodness and you honor him and he's like, surprise, the math works. He is still taking care of our basic needs. And I hate the fact that we have labeled them basic needs because if we didn't have clothes on our back and shoes on our feet and the ability to put gas in our cars and, and, and a car or a place to lay our head, oh, we'd be in a world of hurt. It is a necessity. It's not basic. But he has taken care of these things. But sometimes we get stuck with what we conceive as the big problem we're dealing with and facing. Well, Lord, you haven't fixed this big problem. If you just fix this big problem, I'd be so much happier and life would be so much better. I often wonder, like, man, when I get to heaven, like, how did y'all handle us complaining all the time and questioning you? Like, and you still were there for us. You're still working in our lives. And we just complain and complain. Like, you give us a car, and I'm like, I want a Bentley, God. I want my Bentley. No, you gave me a house, and I'm like, the house isn't big enough. I need an office. My wife needs an office. The kids need rooms, and then we need a guest room. Can't afford that in California. It's business. Huh? Like we, we find so many things that it's not enough and not enough. And yet he still continues to give us and take care of us. He truly is good. You're focusing on that big thing and he's focusing on everything else, keeping you alive so you can even focus on the big thing. But guess what? He's coming to work out the big thing also. Hang in there. 
Verse 10, uh, verse 9, it tells us in the word that's translated here is satisfied. You ever eat and you weren't satisfied? Isn't, isn't that bad if you, if you pay for food and you didn't like it? And then you're like, well, at least they were nice. I still have to tip them, but this food was like, ugh. Isn't that one of the worst feelings? <laughs> And you're like, I'm going to give y'all a dollar, but uh, I know it's not your fault the food is bad. Uh, you're wrestling this whole thing. We understand what it's like to get some food, and it's not really satisfying. But it says here, he has satisfied the thirsty soul. Have you ever been thirsty? You know what it's like working in the 100-degree heat? Those of you who've worked outside or done anything outside in the heat... I, I used to do roofing back in New Jersey. <laughs> huh, is <was> right. <laughs> in summer times back east, it will say 80 degrees, but you add that humidity, that thing is like 101. And you're like, how are you going to be 89, but it really 101? And you're going to tell me it's 89. And I remember sitting out there because there's these, you have to do a pitch roof because you're looking at three-story buildings, you know, East Coast homes. You know what I'm talking about there. And I'm sitting out there, it's like a hundred and something with a blowtorch. Does that make any sense? <laughs> like, it's hot, it's summertime, and I'm working a blowtorch. <laughs> Thirsty was the least of my problems. I was trying not to burn myself half the time. So I, I, I remember coming down the ladder from three stories. You get over fear of heights real quick doing that, man, I tell you. And then just being so, so thirsty, and then even the smallest drop of water felt like manna from heaven. And I was like, oh, oh my goodness, oh, just give me the whole thing and just dump it all over. And we're told here, those moments when we have been thirsty, exercising, whatever you were doing out in the sun, going out to Palm Springs, whatever, what, just being thirsty. You know what it's like to drink some nice cold water and have it hit the spot. Honestly, when you are thirsty, you will take room temperature water. Let's be honest, if there's nothing else, you will take the hot water, too, because <laughs> I'm, like, I'm thirsty. I'm going to take what I can get. It says he satisfies the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled. And it doesn't stop there. It doesn't say he just has filled it. It says he has filled with what is good. He doesn't just fill us to say, <laughs> I gave you some some cream or something there, you figure it out. And you know, we, you, we don't really like that. It's like, oh man, you just gave me some random looking porridge stuff. Like, What's up with that? No, no, no. He says he fills us with something that is good. Because he is good. The following verses from 11, from 11 down to 18 or so, talks about the people. It says they rebelled against the words of God. They spurned the counsel of the Most High. It says he humbled their heart with labor. It says they cried out. He came back. There's this whole give and take where they went away from him and he was still there for them. They, they go back away and want to do their own thing. They're, they're following false gods and they're doing this thing and it's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. 17 says, fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Their soul abhorred, this is verse 18, their soul abhorred all kinds of food and they drew near to the gates of death. So here we see because of their foolish decisions, it actually started to affect their very well being. And I have to just slap the Christian hand here for a moment. A lot of people will take this passage and say, well, when people get sick, it's because they ain't doing right. No, no, no. You miss what happened before this. It says they rebelled against him. This, the psalmist is talking about something very specific, a specific illness that comes about with people who have completely rebelled and pushed God away and said, forget you. This is not the sickness that comes about as a result of sin. But guess what? Later on, he talks about that too, coming back and saving us from the results of sin. 
And even in spite of this self-inflicted health crisis, he was still there to save them. Someone needs to hear this. God does not take joy in our pain and suffering, even when we push him away. This does not make him happy. This is not, he doesn't find like, oh, well, they di they're disobedient. Open up the floodgates, throw some lightning bolts. This does not make him excited. We, we sometimes confuse God with the gods, the Greek gods, and how petty they are. And a lot of that has actually crept into Christianity today, where we have, some people have this notion, well, I must please the gods, and then the gods will bless me. Let me keep it real for some of you. There ain't nothing we could do in and of ourselves that's going to be pleasing 100% to God in and of ourselves. What God finds pleasing is when you call on his name, when you acknowledge him, when you say, I can't do it on my own and I need him. That's when God is pleased and excited. He's like, oh, yeah, I get to show off in their lives and I get to make much of them and I get to do great things for them. He is not pleased when we stick our chest out and be like, I got this. No, no. We're told that our righteousness is filthy rags. And this is why we need saving. And this is why we have to be reminded that he is good. Because in and of ourselves, we are a hot mess. I want to jump to verse 23. Because after spanking the folks a little bit, it goes back to encouragement. It says, those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. Their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. 29, he caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet. So he guided them to their desired haven. The psalmist is using this image of the ship on the high sea and, and calling out for God. And I, I love this fact because we're told whatever storm, whether it be an actual storm, and I know we, we use the analogy of the, phys, the, the literal and figurative storms in our lives, whatever storm there is, he is more powerful and he will hush that storm in your life. The storm of no money. He says he owns a cattle on a thousand hill. The cynic will say, what am I going to do with the cows? <laughs> but he's trying to remind you that he, cows back then was wealth. He's like, I have the power of the wealth. Don't worry about it. The storms in, in our lives that deal with health crises. He's like, I got that. I will hush those storms as well. The storms in our lives that deal with us in relationships that are are in disarray. He is saying, I have that storm covered. Call out call on his name, trust him that he will show up, and he will show up right on time. He truly is good, and he truly wants the best for us. Please, church family, do not let the devil fool you into thinking God does not care about you. Don't allow how you were raised in some other church or whether it was this church and something you heard an elder or pastor say, sway you. No, no, no. He is in the business of saving any and everyone that he possibly can. And he doesn't quit. He can't quit. And he won't stop. It is not in his nature to do that. Jumping down a bit. To verse 31, it says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders. 
Verse 33 says, he changes rivers into wilderness and springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. But wait, it gets better. 35 says, he changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. And there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city and sow fields and plant vineyards and gather a fruitful harvest. Verse 38, the last one I'm going to read, and then we're going to close. He says, also he blesses them and they multiply greatly, and he does not let their cattle decrease. So right here we are seeing the psalmist is reminding us the power of God. He can turn a, a bustling lake and area into a desert if he wants to. But he can also do the opposite. If there's a desert and there's drought, he can bring forth water and life. And we have to understand this imagery of water means life. It is saying God is good and he can bring life to where there is death. God is so good that he can allow this life to make you a place to dwell in. And it says not only just to dwell temporarily, it says they are sowing fields and vineyards, planting vineyards, and they are dwelling there and establishing a city. He's basically saying the goodness of God is so good, not only will it take care of you, but it will take care of all those who come after you. That's the God we serve. That's the God we say thank, thank you to. This is why we're encouraged to say, yes, he is good. And when we say it, to understand all of what he is good means to us, what he has done in our lives, how far he has brought us, all the beautiful things he has done for us that we do not deserve. He is good. And in all of his goodness, the thing that really makes him happy is when his creation Notice I didn't say his people, his creation, even those who don't claim to be his. When they come to an understanding of him and when they trust him and they're like, whoo, whoo, he is good. Oh, man, I was running my life and I was a plum fool. But God picked me up out of the foolishness I was doing. And boy, he is good. We may not have all the answers. We may not understand everything he is doing. But understand this, that the God you say is good is working tirelessly to save as many as he can. And that's why we say he is good. He is good. All creative power, as we are closing. Think about that. The power to speak things into existence. The power to save you from that semi-truck that cut you off. The power to help you keep your cool when your boss came in flying off the handle and was yelling at you and you didn't yell back. The power when someone came up to you at gunpoint and you were like, I should be gone. All creative power is in your corner pulling for you. And we're told to acknowledge him, rejoice in what he has done for us, thank him and continue to reap the benefits of his goodness. Church, the deck is stacked in our favor. The game is rigged for us. Hate to use a betting analogy, but you're getting the inside tip before the game of how the game's going to play out. And he's saying, go all in. <laughs> go all in. And this is so much more important because we are dealing with eternity. And he wants to spend an eternity with each and every one of us. When I was younger, I used to think, what am I going to do forever? Forever is a long time. Will there be sports in heaven? <laughs> what, what does he have planned for us? And I finally come to the realization that the creator God who's constantly creating, I believe he's constantly creating. My little science tip on that, they say the universe is constantly expanding, so why can't God constantly be creating? That'll be a sermon for another day. The creator God who's constantly creating, creating solutions for our problems, who's there waking us up to see a new day, he is saying, 
you don't even understand what I have in store for you for eternity. I just need you to get there. I just need you to get there with me. Whatever he has in store will be more than enough to keep us excited, keep us busy, and keep us like, <laughs> what are we going to do today, God? What are we going to do? I have dreams of flying, man. I don't know how we're going to do it, but I'm going to be flying. I'm going to have a, 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 a pet tiger, a pet lion, and I won't have to walk them on big chains. I, I just When I start thinking about heaven and eternity, and then the earth made new, those who were there yesterday, you know what I, my, my issue. I, I'm under six feet tall. And to have a new body, I'm going to be tall. Man. Well, we're all going to be tall, so I guess it won't really matter. But that's all right. I'll be over six feet. I'll be happy then. You feel me, Anthony, right? You feel me. You feel me. You feel me. We're going to be tall. And to see what this earth is supposed to look like, think of all the beautiful things you've seen here in this state. And we say, ooh, God is good. You go to the beach, you see a sunset. Did you all see the super moon we had this week? That thing was so huge, the, the blue moon. I was like, oh, it's like I'm going to drive into that thing. The moon was huge. And we find beauty in that. And he's saying, y'all ain't seen nothing, man. <laughs> I didn't want you to go through death. I didn't. You know, we find beauty in fall when the leaves change colors. We find beauty in death. That is literally death. And God is saying, man, you like colors. I got some colors for you, boy. Just wait till I come back. That is the goodness of God. The, the, it tells us in the Bible, the lion and the lamb will play together. And you'll be able to stand in the middle of that. And the, the lion won't look at the lamb like a snack. Like, no, that's not going to happen. I'm going to be in the water with the great white sharks and the killer whales and everything. Now, when I go to the beach, I'm like, mm, I hear the Jaws theme. I don't want to mess with that. But to see nature and to see this planet how it was meant to be. And then to leave this place and to see what he has in store for the entire universe. Woo. He's good. And my imagination can keep going, but I'll spare you all. <laughs> he is truly good. And we need to give thanks to his goodness. We need to be reminded of what he has done in our lives. We need to be reminded of how far he's brought us and what he saved us from. And we need to be reminded that he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And I'm coming again to take you back to that place. And then I'm coming again to spend an eternity with you. That's the God we serve. So we're about to pray. And I would ask, if you want your prayer to be, Holy Spirit, help me to give thanks. In the good times, the bad times, and everything in between, I ask that you stand with me. You're asking, be able to give thanks. And in that thanks, you're giving thanks to what he has brought you through. And the goodness of God. And that he doesn't quit on anyone. And he is still active in our lives today. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that in spite of ourselves, there is still evidence in our lives that you are there working on our behalf. Lord, even when we push you away, you are still there trying to get our attention. Lord, many of us are going through difficult times right now. We have lost loved ones. We are hurting financially. We are hurting in, in relationships in our lives. We're just hurting. With all that hurt, Lord, we understand you understand that as well. And you are hurting because your creation wasn't meant for this. So, Lord, in all that hurt, can we find a moment to say thank you for what you have done for us? We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that you sent him down here to put on humanity. We, we're thankful that he, he lived his life and to show us the way. And then he died to save each and every one of us. But he didn't stop there. He jumped out that grave and said, death, you have no more power. So we are thankful that he rose. We are thankful that we can fall on our knees and call out to you immediately. We don't have to pay a little money and have someone else pray for us. We don't have to go to the pastor, the elder. We can go to you directly. 
So we are thankful for that. We are thankful that you brought us here in our right minds. We are thankful that you kept us safe on the slippery roads. We are thankful for the food, the clothes, the home over our head, the car, no matter how beat up or nice it may be that we have. We are thankful that you continue to sustain us. Help us, as the verse says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Help us to say so. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. You may be seated.
stand for a benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Oh,